So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here on Inside Movies Galore. This is episode 45. We're, here we talk about Fred M. Wilcox's 19... Uh, <laughs> you know six uh, film, Forbidden Planet. So, uh, Katie, really that old? Katie, yes, it is. Oh, uh, Katie, God. why don't you... Uh, uh, why don't you try to give us a little bit of a background of the story, if you? Can. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> he asks the one person on the panel here that's not a sci-fi lover. Um, well, uh, I guess these guys, uh, this they I, they were in space for a long time, like a year, right? And there's yeah. this planet that's quiet, right? So they have to go check it out. Mm -hmm. And so they go and they find just two humans living, a guy and his daughter. And supposedly there's this monster roaming the planet that killed everybody else, but him and his daughter are immune to it. And then they figure some things out, but I guess I won't give that away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, was this a first time watch for you? It was, yes. Um, and I didn't realize it was a 1956 movie either until like later I looked it up because I thought, oh, it looked kind of 60s. And and then when I saw 56, I was like, oh, okay. Well, I kind of changed how I feel about it a little. Like I definitely picked up on how Star Trek got inspiration from this film because I saw a lot of things that reminded me of the Star Trek episodes that I used to watch when I was a kid. Okay. Um, so I, I noticed a lot of that and I totally did appreciate the young Leslie Nielsen. That was nice. Um, <laughs> but again, like another sci-fi movie that just and it didn't really blow my skirt up. Like I really appreciated it for what it was and mm -hmm. for how it was like the beginning. And as I'm reading some of the cool things about the, the behind the scenes, the effects and like that Disney did the animation and it was on the same, uh, filmed on the same stage as the Wizard of Oz and they reused parts of the a Munchkin Land in the, set like th those are cool things so i appreciate all of that stuff about the film but as far as like the actual story itself or the movie itself it didn't really blow my skirt up unfortunately <laughs> dane why don't you uh step up to the plate and uh, uh when was your first uh experience with this film well i actually let me see i got to watch it like I want to say sometime last year. Yeah, that was my first time. I wish I'd have seen it earlier. I uh, It's definitely something I would have watched when I was a kid because I watched a lot of stuff like that when I was young and still today watch plenty of stuff like that. <coughs> Sorry, I'm kind of getting over, not really cold, but just drainage. Anyway, um, that's why my voice sounds kind of scraggly. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely something I would have liked when I was a kid. I'm kind of glad I saw it when I was older, though, because I feel like I was able to understand a lot more of not only the impact it had on science fiction uh, with Star Trek and with just cinematic sci-fi in general, but the fact that it is an adaptation of William Shakespeare's The Tempest, which I hadn't read when I was a kid, obviously. Uh, but then I, yeah, it was. And uh, The Tempest is one of my favorites of Shakespeare's. And uh, it was very, it was faithfully done. It wasn't uh, terribly in your face. Obviously, it wasn't a straight dialogue adaptation, but it's got a lot of the um, kinds of characters. It's got, you know, the wizard. It's got his daughter. It's got a monster of sorts. It's got danger. It's a, you know, strange land that they crash land onto and all that kind of stuff. So it hits all the main uh, story points, just does it in an interesting way. And also, uh, something that not a lot of people know, it was the first time that the theremin, the instrument, the theremin, was used in a film for the score. Because that was, I think, a new thing back in the 50s as a way to make music with... Uh, remind me of the electromagnetic uh, waves that were able to produce that sound and then they were able to uh use it for the soundtrack and that helped to inspire 
what science fiction films sounded like from then on. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Uh, Dustin, uh, w- was this a first time watch for you? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'd kind of, I'd heard of it before, but I think I confused it with, uh, <laughs> at first I confused it with, I think it was called Fantastic Planet. Uh, okay. So it was like, surprise, you don't have this movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we ended up watching it a little bit later than usual, uh, which is saying something. Uh, but I thought it was Slatter. pretty cool. Like I didn't realize I didn't realize how old it actually was. Like I thought it was like an early seventies movie. Um, and to me, it felt like a lot of sci-fi tropes and concepts just kind of put together. Like it didn't quite seem to flow together for me. Like a lot of it was exposition based. However, it was still pretty entertaining. Uh, like the first forty minutes or so, I was kind of like tuned out until I got engaged with it. Um. But it, um, it well, and it did not go where well, I thought it would too. So that was that was kind of a nice plus because a lot of times with older movies, I can kind of predict where they're get, what they're gonna do, and uh, well, they they surprised me. What, one thing I should make clear is um, one science fiction movie that I did grow up with, which kind of uh, lumps in also with the the Universal Monsters. Uh, is the creature from the Black Lagoon, which that was 1954. Which remind me the year of this was this 53? I this think 56. 56. Okay, so it's but bottom line is it's in that area. Uh, it's in the roughly the same time period. But the point is that in science fiction movies of the 50s, which the 50s was the decade of the science fiction film, um, in those movies typically they're very exposition heavy. <laughs> Because they're trying to explain these concepts to people who normally probably I've wouldn't know what they are. Like yeah, but even more than that, there was sort of this. It was a twofold situation. You had the wonder of the space race, which was just on the horizon. It was just after World War II, you know. So the Axis powers are defeated, all that stuff. But then you also had the threat of the Cold War looming overhead so it was this weird sort of hopeful but scary time and the and... end of the atomic age as well exactly but then you had so you had all this these different conflicting emotions going on um and you had all these new concepts that are arising and so then you had like in this case you have space travel but then in the one that i grew up with was creature from the black lagoon in there you had it was all about the past you know it was all about evolution going in a way that we didn't expect it was about marine life it was about the life here on earth that we don't fully understand which in fact we actually know very little about deep the deep oceans we arguably know more about deep space um you know at least in terms of what we've been able to pick up from data you know um it's harder it's harder to travel down in the deep oceans but the point is, like, the, the exposition in movies of that period, they, uh, well, largely, again, the audience wasn't used to it, but it was also kind of the age of wonder mixed with the age of paranoia. And it does, the films of that period, they have kind of a magic to them that future science fiction films couldn't really hope to match, at least in my opinion. And with Creature from the Black Lagoon, it kind of got me inspired for the wonders of science and of marine biology and of you know life on earth let alone what something like forbidden planet would have done for people with uh space travel on the horizon and as we found out on the near horizon because the moon landing was in 69 uh somewhat somewhat related thing like creature from the black lagoon is pretty sweet like it's in my opinion it's the only like universal you know what? Fight me. It's the only Universal monster movie worth a damn. Uh, well, I'm going to fight you about that because I absolutely love all the Universal monster movies, so I will definitely fight you over that one. <laughs> I can't remember what happens in the other ones. I'm not sure if I've actually seen them all yet. Well, you better. <laughs> Combat. <laughs> Let's go, Dan. Ready. <laughs> uh, I'll, see your, I'll see your Freddies and your Jasons, and I'll raise you Bela Lugosi Dracula and Boris Karloff, Frankenstein, and Claude Rains as the Invisible Man, and all those great classics. 
I did see the Invisible Man. I thought it was more funny than frightening. Uh, yeah, but it's... that's probably the idea. Uh, it's It's got some moments of... What'll be more funnier is if Johnny Depp plays the Invisible Man, eh? Oh, no. Please God. Please God, no. Please. Freddy versus the Invisible Man. <laughs> Make it happen. Oh man. We have to come uh, a new line for that, right? <laughs> well, in any case, what uh like I was telling uh the group before uh, uh we started. Uh, I was a I was a child when I uh, when I first saw this uh, film, so I was uh I was maybe like 8 or 9 when I first saw this, uh, so I was still at, in that age of you know, wonder and mysticism. Um, my mom, she uh, used to work for a place called Tesseract Arts and Crafts out uh, out in uh, Mequon, and uh, uh, the, the the owner's daughter. She uh, uh, she used to have all these like taped like nineteen forties fifties films. So the, uh, the first film that I remember seeing uh, was actually when she plopped me down in front of a black and white uh, white uh, white tv you know with the turn dial uh uhf uh, uh, whatever no antenna whatsoever just whatever was in the tv and turned it on and i saw and i saw it and uh it, it just it just amazed me at the time especially with the sounds because sound uh, the, the soundtrack was uh, all of a sudden you heard the boom boom Boom, 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 and, and you know it was just kind of, <laughs> kind of hysterical at at, at, at one point. At point, um, I just, I think I, I remember watching some replay of episodes from Lost in Space at the time. So I was really into science fiction films at that time, and uh, 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 see. Uh, to me, yeah, you, it, you have the spaceship that it it, it kind of looks like a UFO. It was a UFO, like <laughs> it was just flat out a freaking UFO. It's like, wow, yeah. they didn't uh, dress it up or nothing. It's <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we've got humans inside of a UFO who are going down to a planet called Altera. and like Kate, uh, Katie uh, 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 said, that there are. Uh, only two human beings, but they also had a man saved a servant robot that did everything for them. And that, uh, that robot was, uh, was uh, it, that was back when they actually, uh, there were two robots that, uh, that I remember specifically from any, anything. And, and that was Robbie, the robot, which believe it or not, this robot actually starred in one other film. Um, I, I almost, I almost uh, started with that. When I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, that's the robot from Gremlins." <laughs> no, um, uh, that uh, it also starred in uh, another uh, uh, film from the fifties called "The Invisible Boy," where oh, that's that Robbie the robot. I think is what his name was, right? Correct, yeah. Robbie the robot. He yeah. even and, had the same. Uh, as they even used to, his dialogue a, in Gremlins. As opposed to Rob the robot, which I think was the name in Lost in Space, right? Um, I believe so. And they were similar robots, but they were de definitely differently made. Yeah, it was similar, but different. And then you had... Similarly Rob, uncreative. Maybe. Well, and then you had Rob the Robot, the NES accessory, which also was vaguely similar in its shape. Correct. It was vaguely um, overpowered and... Katie, uh, was, there, uh, uh, was there anything that you noticed about uh, uh, the, the female uh, who uh, was uh, uh, played in the, uh, in the film? Was there anything that, uh, that you could say about uh, her character? <clears throat> well, I thought it was an interesting dynamic. <laughs> like, you know, she's... I guess doesn't know like it's just been her and her dad all this time and she doesn't know anything and suddenly all these like cute boys show up so and i guess i don't know it was really weird um, <laughs> and i realized yeah it was the 50s <laughs> yeah and it's like oh, I it was the 50s so i get it like it didn't really um make a lot of sense how she transitioned into a relationship right away but 
whatever. Well, it was, I guess I know, young it, Leslie Nielsen. It was the what, 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 what I was I was, was kind of like, yeah, uh, like on a lot what, of those scenes. What I believe is uh, is that I. I actually don't think that he. Uh, uh, I think the film actually explained that um, he'd actually created the, the daughter from the machines of, uh, uh, that were on the planet. I thought that's what I thought they were gonna. That's what I thought they were gonna do, but they left it kind of the way it ended. It, like it was kind of like she really was like his daughter from like his wife. Well, uh, may I, I really may I interject as far as the. Uh, the evidence that we have to draw from, which is, again, from the source text, The Tempest, mm -hmm. where you have uh, Prospero, the wizard. He, he gets banished to the island, and he, um, his daughter, he, with his infant daughter, Miranda, who grows up on the island without knowing any other males besides her father and Caliban, who's a monster. In this case, he got Rob, Robbie the robot. Um, and then she comes across uh, the first men that she ever has seen, which is the other people who get shipwrecked on the island. She meets Ferdinand. And because, you know, it's the first time she's ever seen another, uh, you know, male who is not her father and who's young, then that's immediately exciting and new and different and all that stuff. So, I mean, she's still very childlike as a character. And, and the same kind of thing going on here. So, um, you know, it's more just like the kind of mental, uh, mental isolation, kind of mental state of arrested development kind of thing uh, that you have with, uh, with isolation in this kind of fantastical world. And, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where that comes from in the source text. And again, it's not just the two men uh, uh, per se, it's an entire ship full of men that end up talking at her. Uh, because they've been out in space for how many months or years or or whatever at a, a time, and this is probably the first female that uh, the the men on the ship have seen in quite some time. So yeah, they're they're gonna uh, they're gonna drop their jaw and drool. You know, it's <laughs> anybody notice that they dressed them up like sailors or all that stuff? Yeah. Um, there was one guy who was dressed as a sailor, and that was the guy who was trying to get the booze from uh, from, uh, from Robbie the robot. And... <laughs> well, I kind of got the impression that, you know, I guess this would be the first experiences of a spaceship, right? So they would model it after a boat because that's maybe the only, like, the closest thing to model a spaceship. Auto, I mean, they say I, I captain and the skipper and all that boat talk. Yeah. So to have them look well, yeah, like so, sailors, that wasn't so far off. Well, that's yeah, I, like I kind of figured that again, too. That in the source uh, text, again, in the source text with the Tempest, you have um, they they use well formal what would have been nautical terms of the time, like boats and and you know things like that. And so then the next nearest thing would be at the time the modern naval uh terms you know so like captain and admiral and all that and you had star trek take that and run with it you know where the organization of starfleet is that same way you know captain and it. admiral and the they did it with star captain. wars too yeah they did and i mean if i i'd probably i'm sure that other sci-fi novels and stories have probably been doing that for a lot longer you know than even that movie but until I that saw seems their, normal to me. Until I saw their crewmen in like actual sailor outfits, I never really made the connection. <laughs> what did you think oh, about in the inside of in the control anything? Room? What did you think about the inside of the control room on the spaceship? On on our hero spaceship or inside of the the complex that they have All I remember is the Krell control room. Well, uh, uh, we can speak about, about that in a little bit, but uh, the, uh, on the actual heroes uh, uh, spaceship, um, uh, well, it definitely um, the design of the Enterprise definitely owes a lot to it. It has a lot of well clear functionality, but it also was very you know fifty fifties futuristic in its decor, and um, the uniforms even you could see kind of where. At the very least, the original Star Trek pilot, um, 
not not the one that actually made it to air, but the original original that they you're filmed. talking about the man trap. No, uh, no, that's the awesome. one. No, the man trap was the one that aired. I'm talking about the one that they didn't air that they used the footage for later in the menagerie. Like I'm talking about the original pilot. Okay, um, that's uh, that's what only only Spock is the original. That's right. He was the only uh, original 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 cast uh member to or original character to last but um you could at least see where the uh design elements for that carried over and uh you know similar organization i remember that there were similar um well obviously you had a kirk equivalent and like there were some secondary officers that you're like okay mm-hmm. i can see i can see them inserting spock here i can see them inserting Dr. McCoy over here and you know that kind of stuff and I mean in similar Star Trek fashion you have the captain who falls in love with the the beautiful girl on the alien world and you know he's very dashing and you know all that kind of stuff which again that's very very Star Trek (laughs) Leslie Nielsen was pretty awesome it's like it was so weird to not see see him not with gray hair like it was like wait is that Or the like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and he was he was a very um, the, like like I said last time he was a very accomplished dramatic actor on television in his day, and you can really see the acting chops that he had. And then just with airplane onward, he was able to just kind of be silly and be really good at that by being serious in a silly situation. <laughs> I enjoyed him in this movie. I enjoy Leslie Nielsen anyway, but I enjoyed it, the young version of him in a serious role. I And I like him in Creepshow in his serious role as well. So I can see why I liked his performance here. I also liked uh, Walter Pigeon's uh, performance as the uh, father figure in, in here. Uh, even though I know he was on an estranged world, uh, he, he was very charismatic and very much cared about the alien technology that was left upon the world. And uh, that is how uh, the monster was in fact, the, uh, the, uh, the, the creature that dwelled in the darkness of his mind, you know, and uh, that, that is, uh, that is the ultimate thing. What I liked about this movie, your, your his own soul, his own uh, uh, aura, uh, it, with inside his mind is what you know killed his everyone. own his own subconscious impulses correct made real through the technology like that's i thought that was i personally that found was... that kind of funny because in a lot of in a lot of uh, like content where you have that kind of concept it's like oh we've evolved beyond this or we've grown beyond that like that always makes me laugh because it's like no you haven't like just expose yourself to some pressure or something will happen that'll show you just how wrong you are uh, so, uh, no, I enjoyed that. Dane, what did you think about the uh, uh, the uh, once we started to see the bowels of the Krell um, uh, uh, rooms? The, yeah, the- I I really liked. Well, here's the thing that I was the visual effects for this film are not that many, uh, aside from like set design and like a practical robot. Like, there's not that many effects in this that you can really see one of the most stunning to this day is the way that the interior looks because it looks so massive and that's a testament to their use of matte paintings and scale how gorgeous the art that they use to composite all that together yeah how gorgeous that all looks and the perspective shots they did it's like the scope that it conveys with what they had at the time is pretty remarkable well and it's just a neat it's a neat way to make the uh exposition pop in a really beautiful and interestingly filmed location and especially about these uh concepts which are very non-physical by design which again um for tying it back to the source text the idea of the island the tempest island is that it's full of spirits, you know, and, and Prospero is able to communicate with the spirits through his books, you know, mm-hmm. spells, and um, and so that's where the source of his power comes from. And so, kind of similarly, you have these beings that are non-physical, you know, and uh, 
so it's it's another good way to carry over that idea into a science fiction uh, context. And you can only imagine, uh, uh, since there were more of these beings, of these Krell, that uh, there must have been a, some kind of advanced civilization that was able to create uh, either they, uh, either these were the subconscious monsters within other people's minds that were on the well, that's that's also um that also ties into the source text in the sense <clears throat> that the um what prospero is able to do with his power is very much influenced by the acts of generosity that he is able to give towards his daughter towards ferdinand once he gains his trust but then also um some of the rage that he feels towards those who betrayed him by making their ship crash there onto the island and scaring them with weird sounds and with other you know creatures and things that they see on the island and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff so it's that same kind of thing that the non-physical creatures have a, their own kind of sense of, or rather that, you know, good and ill intentions have after effects um, in a non-physical way upon physical beings, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, did uh, anyone feel like the, uh, this was a film ahead of its time? Oh, Yeah. Like, I thought it took place, I thought it was made a full 20 years, like, after it apparently was. I was really surprised in the pre-show when we were like, oh, it's from 1956. It's like, wait, really? <laughs> uh, yeah. Certainly in terms of uh, the instruments that used on the soundtrack. I think it was, I think it was all theremin, in fact. It had a lot of awesome too. sound. I thought the soundtrack was pretty it sweet. Does. I have the soundtrack. It is- I think it was very that was very ahead of its time and it influenced not only uh the way that science fiction movies sounded from then on but it influenced just a lot of music in general it was very very avant-garde for its time another another film to look at in terms of uh science fiction and an avant-garde way ahead of its time score um was um well not 2001 cuz that was all pre-existing classical music that was more how music was used. In terms of an original score, uh, it was actually Planet of the Apes. Um, that was a very avant-garde score. Really, really good. Um, but then, interestingly enough, once you get to Star Wars, then you get back to traditional symphonic, kind of 1930s kind of score. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, very much ahead of its time in terms of music and everything else, really, but especially the music. So, um, Katie, uh, is there anything that stands out to you in this uh, f- uh, film? Uh, not that it, it wowed you or anything like that. Uh, 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 and I know that you, you have some uh, appreciation for its time period. But is there anything that stands out to you overall in the film? Um, overall, I guess there wasn't anything that was... Um, you know, probably because... I'm seeing it after seeing things like Star Wars and Star Trek and like all the stuff that came after that it inspired. Like, I guess for me, that was the biggest thing that I noticed all of the, the other science fiction that drew from this film. So I kind of gave it kudos for that. I would say that was probably the, the biggest thing that stood out for me and yeah, it didn't wow me or whatever, but you know, I'm not big on science fiction, so we can't be surprised. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, at least you had some appreciation for uh, uh, for, uh, for oh, absolutely. It. I definitely give you kudos for that. <laughs> um, absolutely. Dane, um, would uh, would you uh, do you have a favorite moment in the film that uh, that you thought was inspirational from it? Inspirational to me, like as an artist, or as an I mean, artist? There's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to interpret that. Okay. Inspirational to me. Let me think. Well, certainly, um, I think, well, two things. Um, I think in terms of the story, it speaks to the, and this, this is more like the story as a whole rather than a specific moment. It's, it's a little cheating, but like, I think that the way that they adapted the Tempest in a way that did justice to the story, but it wasn't, it was still its own 
like it stands on its own two feet. You don't have to have read The Tempest in order to get it. Um, I think that that speaks to the enduring power of Shakespeare as, well, the greatest writer in the English language. And the fact that those stories still speak to people centuries after he died, centuries after he was writing, and the fact that they can be reinterpreted and retold to new generations constantly um, across the centuries, I think that's a beautiful thing. That inspires me for sure. In terms of a specific moment, I honestly really love the opening credits just because there's such a strong mood with the I don't know, the blackness of space plus the theremin score, the fact that it sounds so eerie and so weird and so foreboding but cool at the same time. It's like... Sounds a, a little bit like movies, the Babadook soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, but like a lot of a lot of movies in general don't really know how to kind of suck you in with the um, the atmosphere early on. And I think one of the key ways to do that is with an avant-garde score, which that really had. And uh, so that I find very inspirational is how to hook people early and keep their attention with something that they don't expect. Okay. Um, and Dustin, do you have some similar... Um... Response. Uh, it's kind of hard to pick out a moment that I would find inspiring per se. I was I was somewhat drawn to the concept and like for me what I got out of the movie was as they were explaining it's like, oh, the alien civilization did this and did that and like my mind was firing ways to expand upon those kinds of themes. Okay. Uh, about like forgetting forgetting like what your true nature can be like and how dangerous that can be. Uh, and so I kind of got I got some of that. Uh, mostly, I think I just like I mostly liked the art and the set direction. Like everything was creative and beautiful and unique. Like in terms of uh, like their effects, their effects were surprisingly believable, which I didn't think was really possible for fifties movie. Uh, at least to the level that they used. Um, they basically used like Godzilla laser blast um uh, but it didn't look as fake those were actually animated by disney like cartoons over the screen or whatever yeah somebody disney mentioned that animation. earlier oh. that which, was me which, that would find the quality which is <laughs> uh, which is interesting uh, that uh, that you, uh, you could still use some animation to uh, do some films you know in 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 retrospect as back uh, in a sense, it was like the earlier, uh, early, er, er, earlier renditions of like CGI effects. But I think, uh, I think that the effects used with actual artists actually looks more natural. But uh, it's, that it's so. very, it is true. You're right. Like one of the arts that try uh, in terms of visual effects, one of the arts that um, tragically has kind of gone away. Well, like like practical effects in terms of like models and puppets and creature suits and stuff like those have kind of come back in in some ways but like one of the ones that hasn't quite come back is claymation you see it a little bit with some animated films like Frank and Weenie and with some of the Ardman animation productions and things but I'm talking about like claymation um for animating creatures and stuff like the I don't, I don't know if you saw the latest version of it, but there was the one creature that kind of looked like it was, at least the movements were somewhat claymation, but it wasn't full on. It just seemed like it was inspired by that a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Which, which scene was that? That was the one with the, I think it was the headless boy. Yeah, the, yeah, it was it. clearly CG, but it had it had kind of a weird feel to it. Yeah, it, it I was can, sort of had that nice kind of jerk. It had that kind of nice jerky movement that a lot of claymation can have. Like, and, and I mean that as as a compliment. Uh, there's just something mm -hmm. kind of magical about claymation that you can't really reproduce. That was uh, there's a if anybody's ever seen the show Gravity Falls, that was a joke they did in one episode. They had um, they basically met Ray Harryhausen 
and the secret of Ray Harryhausen in the show was that the clay figures were alive, like he never stopped motion animated anything because they said, quote, it was too impractical. Uh, and then there's a joke where like all the clay creatures like fight and they actually clay, they, they did claymation like the creatures for a few scenes. And then for the actual fight, it's just like cast in shadow. And they're like, wow, <laughs> I bet if we were to turn the cat, I bet if we were to look from a different direction, this would be really expensive. <laughs> all righty. So, uh, it, um, did anyone else have anything else to add? I thought the whole thing was pretty cool. Like, I'm happy we saw it. Uh, I did want to kind of, I did want to share my own, like, you know, everybody had their, my first sci-fi movie thing. Um, in my case, uh, my dad used to go to video stores a lot. And they let me rent Alien when I was three years old. <laughs> uh and I loved watching the alien kill people, but when Ash's head came off, like that freaked me out. Uh, and we've kind of been there ever since. <laughs> so uh, this was not my kind of sci-fi. I, I tend to like the more action-oriented sci-fi. It was a, rather than the like conceptual sci-fi, but it was pretty good. I mean, I'm again, I'm happy I saw it. Uh, and I'd probably recommend it to people, too, if they want kind of a sci-fi. Well, uh, the reason why I wanted to uh, go through this one is uh, is because uh, when I think science uh, science fiction, uh, this, uh, this is where I tell people to start. Uh, I mean, this was a film uh, like I think we've discovered is ahead of its time. At least in in some respects, as far as music or whatnot, it it, it kind of draws you in at the get uh, get go. Uh, I mean, it doesn't exactly what uh, what is it? Uh, wow, uh, many people, if you've been desensitized to it, uh, uh, like by films uh, uh, that have you know a way better mood sen uh, sense, a way better action scenes, uh, whatnot. Well, I I get that, but um. It, it, uh, science fiction films used to be a hell of a lot more dramatic, and they used to have bigger concepts that, uh, 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 because so much was unknown at that time. And uh, this is a, a fair example to, uh, to start with. And I, I thank you guys for taking this journey with me. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty well, good. One that I would recommend on a similar kind of conceptual level, but also having a great deal of artistry and really ahead of its time of visual effects and pathos and all that stuff would actually be Metropolis from 1927. Metropolis <laughs> is pretty sweet. Like, it was unbelievably long, and they probably should have cut, like, an hour from it, but... It depends uh, on which version you're talking about, because... Well, yeah. actually, I hear the original version of Metropolis was four hours, and... The only footage, they could only find enough footage for a three hour version. That's kind of the story as I heard it. And it was like, holy crap, like it's cool, but I don't know if it was that cool. What was Fritz I, Lang doing? Oh, well, I got to see um, the complete Metropolis, or rather as complete as it'll ever be. Yeah. Uh, too. I, got to, I got to see it on the big screen uh, oh. when, in, 20, in 2010 when it got. <laughs> when the footage got discovered and everything got <laughs> pretty much all put back in place, um, I got to see it on the big screen. It was amazing because it was like you got to – I mean, the footage, the quality of the footage wasn't very good. They did the best they could with how kind of degraded it was. But, like, it was a pretty amazing thing to see one of the best films ever made, one of the – crowning achievements of world cinema in about as good a shape as it's ever going to be. And you see like how much care went into it and how it's, it's really great science fiction on the thinking level, but it's just a great work of art, of pathos, of dramatic storytelling, of germ expressionism, silent cinema. It's like everything I love kind of all Which, wrapped up in the world. Eventually, I want to uh, touch on a few silent uh, 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 films to, uh, to down the road, if everyone doesn't mind. <laughs> I have I have White Zombie. <laughs> That's not silent. That's 1932. It's not? I can't remember. The black and light ones are all alike. <laughs> not always. 
<laughs> I'm just like trying to uh, piss you off. I'm talking like uh, Uncheney, Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Phantom yeah. Perry. I have. We could, uh, we could go way far back and do uh, the uh, Thomas Edison. Edison. Frankenstein from like 1901 or 1902, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. God, what well, were those effects for like? Those, uh, for <laughs> those, uh, for those, for those films, we could probably almost do like three in one because they were shorter. Well, the funny part about the you're saying about the effects for that Edison's Frankenstein, what's funny? They were actually really cool for the time. Like they're kind of neat. Really. Um, and, uh, even with, uh, Nosferatu, uh, from 1922, uh, I mean, there were some definite, you know, facts about it that I didn't know. And that was, that was the first film I'd actually re- reviewed myself. Uh, um, the, um, what's funny is the, uh, the Bram Stoker estate actually so- uh, sued F.W. Murnau because he didn't <laughs> have the rights to adapt Dracula. That's why at the last minute they were changing the inner titles to Count Orlock and, all the changing the names of the characters and stuff, and I think they still got sued for it. But of course, both works have since fallen into the public domain, so now it doesn't matter. As the great Ian Malcolm, <laughs> as the great Ian Malcolm once said, "Life finds a way." It does indeed. <laughs> yeah, now, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure my the copy of Nosferatu I saw was a boot because it had. For its soundtrack, it was literally just like a typo negative album. Like they just picked a typo oh. negative album, and that was the music. Well, here's the thing: like what you probably watched was there's like an industrial album cut of the film where like a bunch of uh, industrial artists were um, putting a lot of songs to it. And actually, with a lot of silent films, you'll find a lot of different scores floating around. Like there is sometimes the original score still exists. Certainly not an original recording of it, but like the actual music sheets. Um, and then other times they'll find like classical music they'll put to it. Sometimes you'll have like the uh, Giorgio Moroder cut of Metropolis, which has a lot of 80s pop songs in it, like really? Adam Ant and Adam Ant and you know, all these different contemporary artists are on there. Um, <laughs> Which it's interesting, but it's not at all as good as the complete Metropolis. And then you have like I don't know, you can just have all kinds of stuff that you find because guess what? It's public domain. They can slap any music they want on there. Why not? You know. Alrighty. So um, if uh, anyone else doesn't have anything else to add, uh, I'm gonna wrap this up here. So um, why don't uh, why don't we start with Katie? Uh, Katie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you, where you come from, what you do? Sure thing. Um, I am Katie Cadaver from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm a body positive horror artist and alternative model. Um, you can find me on Instagram at third eye open. That's three R D E Y E zero P E N. I'm also the makeup artist for the horror punk band Rat Bat Spider. You can find Rat Bat Spider at on Bandcamp at ratbatspider.bandcamp.com. I am also a dead girl for Dead Girls Dark Coffin Classics horror TV show, and you can find that show at vimeo.com/ddcc. And I'm also a performer and producer for Grindhouse Tees Burlesque. And you can find us on facebook.com slash grindhouse tees. Awesome. Uh, Dane, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do? All right. So um, I am Dane Kyle, independent uh, writer, director, filmmaker out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, let's see, I uh, just work in all kinds of different uh Pro- working on all kinds of different projects at the moment, kind of trying to decide which ones should go first because, you know, trying to balance out people's schedules and that kind of stuff. But um, I'm working hard on a web series at the moment and uh, a couple shorts in the works. Um, let's see, Aeternus, my short film is in rotation on the American Horrors Roku channel. I got another one that's uh, my film noir, The Big Blind, which is almost done, finally. Uh, yeah, just 
2018 is the kind of the year of a lot of a lot of product coming out finally. Cool. Hey, uh, Dustin, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do, uh, where you're from? Well, uh, I live here in Milwaukee, and I go to UW. Uh, I collect movies and um, and other horror related things. And so I do my best to show that stuff off on my Instagram, uh, D-H-R-H-U-N-T-E-R. So D-H-R Hunter. It's supposed to be Dustin Horse Hunter. Hunter. I couldn't think of I couldn't think of anything more clever. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> but I have a lot of fun uh, posting stuff on there. And I have an unbelievable amount of shit. So, uh, yeah, the more followers I get, the more I'll actually be putting things up. So... Make make me do stuff. <laughs> cool. Uh, and uh, I am uh, David Streggy. I am an independent film producer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I run Movies Galore of Milwaukee, which is a blog as well as a group. Uh, I also run Inside Movies Galore, which is what you are listening to. And I have a a few projects in the wor- uh, works as uh, uh, myself, some with Dan Kyle, which I still have to get around to, and uh, uh, another horror film in the in the works, which I have been telling everyone about. Uh, about. But I will uh, know more as soon as it comes out, which is Wrestle Massacre for 2018 with Brad Twig. So definitely check it out once it comes out and available on DVD. And I will let everyone know when that date is. So stay tuned. Uh, for- Wrestle Massacre is what we all wish that WrestleMania would be. <laughs> Correct. Just like and with like chainsaws or whatever. I- I'm hoping that it's going to be better than pro wrestlers versus zombies. Yeah, I still uh, haven't. I have that in my collection. I still haven't finished it because it's just aside from the people that are in it, just plot wise and production wise, it's just very not engaging. And <laughs> I know that. And I was talking to I was talking to Lloyd at Dragon Con one year, and he was like, "This is not a good movie, but it's notable for who's in it. You know, who all they got to cameo in it." And yeah, I, I kind of concur, but. And the thing is, there have been a lot of good movies about pro wrestling, you know, and that's unfortunately it's not really one of them. The yeah. wrestler was awesome, like, but uh, really I love bad. That. From what like, I understand, oh my god, the, so uh, good. The uh, son of the Cuban assassin is the main wrestler in the film. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Cuban uh, assassin. Yeah, the son of the uh, Cuban assassin mm-hmm. is in this film, and. From what I hear, there are many different cameos from some earlier wrestlers, too. And I, I know he had a hard time funding. I, I yeah. actually put quite a, few, uh, quite a few hundred into this film just to help him out. I got to, I got to meet... Uh, Why is he in a suit? I got to meet Kane. Um, in, that's an in-joke. I got to meet Kane at dra- this last Dragon Con. He was really, really nice. He's like seven feet tall, and he's like a beast to to look at but he's really nice and gentle um and uh then let's see i uh the other uh great wrestling film to see um is a documentary it's called beyond the mat we should probably watch that at some point i'm interested Uh, i'm interested in down for uh for documentaries uh, i did have a couple more things that i had completely forgotten about um so Adam Green did an AMA on Reddit, and he actually answered a couple of my questions, and so I was pretty stoked about that. Uh, also, remember to go pick up Victor Crowley like when it comes out, because I like Adam Green and support Adam Green. Definitely. So everyone say good night. <laughs> support Adam Green so he can be rolling in the green. <laughs>